Welcome to the MRX Influencers Podcast, where you come for the insights, but stay for the good times. I'm Dan Fleetwood, and on this podcast, I chat with the best and brightest minds in the research space. On this episode, I chat with Laura Bright, who is a marketing strategy and market research consultant. We talk about converting data into actionable insights, talk about some of the trends in the market research industry, and really how to turn data into stories that work for researchers, decision makers, and brands alike. Hope you enjoy the chat I had with Laura. Welcome to the MRX Influencers Podcast, where you come for the insights, but stay for the good times. I'm Dan Fleetwood, and on this podcast, I chat with the best and brightest minds in the research space. All right, well, let's go ahead and bring in Laura Bright. Laura, hey, how are you? Good morning. How are you guys? Or good I'm, afternoon, wherever hey, you're tuning in from. I'm doing great, doing great. So Laura Bright, if you don't know her, she's been on the supplier side, been on the client side, has a lot of experience that spans advertising research agencies and brand ownership perspectives. So really a great knowledge source. Laura and I first got connected on Clubhouse and we were in rooms, yeah. you know, week after week chatting with a bunch of our research peers and we enjoyed it so much that I couldn't wait to get Laura. Laura, welcome. I appreciate you joining. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be with you guys. Yeah, no, Laura, we were talking the other day and we were about, you know, paradigm shifts and how seemingly like meaningless data at first glance can lead to big insights. And you kind of championed this at one of the companies you were at. So maybe just kind of give that framework for people around what you saw and then what you were able to do with that data that you mentioned. Yeah, sure. I've always kind of been against the stream, I think is the nicest way to say it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't like presentations by the kilo, as we call them here, the pound, you, yeah, that's you true. all, <laughs> where you're paying for volume or where you're preparing your deck for the auditors to show that we asked everything we said and here are the findings. Mm -hmm. That's fine that that gets warehoused somewhere. But what I really want to do when I sit down and talk to business leaders is figure out how with this new information, we can solve a pressing need in the business. Mm -hmm. And too many times I sat in the C-suite presenting and at the end of a presentation that I was very proud of and everything tied up nicely and there were no confusing, contradictory data points. And, you know, I was like, oof, done. And the questions they had for me were never addressed in the deck. Mm. And I started thinking about mm. that and I thought, hmm, that wasn't a lackadaisical presentation. That was a good one. And that happened more yeah. than once. So mm -hmm. I started thinking about it, realized that really we've got to diagnose much better what's going on in the business and what's the key thing to be solved. Or what are the facts that are just taken for granted that mm -hmm. you don't realize you do something about? So I had in a presentation, right. one chart that was about planned and unplanned purchase. The planned purchase was 83%. The unplanned purchase <clears throat> was 27%. We mm -hmm. spent more than a half an hour talking about that one slide because what we realized is 27% is a healthy little chunk. And if you work with that and try to grow that, and mm -hmm. what does an unplanned just mean? And that means less price sensitivity. And that means willing to try a brand in this category. And that means, and that means, and that means, and it's not the bargain hunters. And it's right. not the people right. that are just restocking. And so it changed a whole program for that brand in terms of how to think about planned versus unplanned. When anybody else would have gone, big chunk of that pie is the 83%, nothing here. This is a big old nothing burger and right. gone right, right past. And what we tried to focus on, again, one slide, one simple question. Another one was a 50-50% volume consumption coming from males, females. Since the population is that way, that's not so surprising. Surprising right. thing was right. the company thought it was a female brand. So to learn that 50% of volume was coming from wow. men. Interesting. Changed thing radically. And then we started doing much more of our marketing messaging to couples. Because if we got the woman's one glass, men also drink three to one in this particular category, the volume of women. <laughs> so if the man would join in one occasion, all of a sudden I got four drinks instead of one. That was powerful stuff. Right, right. So again, just looking at one simple question and understanding your business dynamic and what's the problem to be solved is so much more helpful sometimes than all the sophisticated analysis. Now, mind you, there's plenty of sophisticated analysis to lead to that and to take us forward. I don't mean to say this is the end all and be all, but I mm -hmm. think if you know what business 
problem you're trying to solve for. Right, right. So much more powerful. Yeah, I like that 50% example because, you know, the company didn't realize like, well, 50% of my clients are male. And it wasn't just the males buying it for the females. The males were consuming the product. And then you kind of take it a step further at a three to one ratio. Obviously, you see dollar signs, you know, coming out of your head and everything, right? So that's an, (laughs) I like that. That's interesting. And we had a sizable base to work on. Now, that's not going to be the solution for every brand, but we had a big enough chunk there to work with that if we could get one incremental occasion with the man present drinking the same. Mm -hmm. And so it turned around a 16 year slump for the brand, got it stabilized, and then we went into growth territory and woo! Nice. (laughs) Yeah. You're all doing happy dances, right? That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Perfect. And then I know another thing we were kind of chatting about that I wanted to dive into a little more is around data, you know, storytelling. And you think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that too many insights are just on that one data set and don't take in account the business or the outside market or what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about that, Laura? This is my favorite topic. I'd be happy to talk about this, Dan. I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) So I think storytelling, and I don't mean to diminish anyone that has storytelling powers. I think it's great. I think it's helpful. We know people have a hard time with numbers. Put it in a story context, and it's more relatable. It's more memorable. I don't want to diminish any of that power. But I think we are doing ourselves as an industry a disservice when we focus so much on the storytelling Because the storytelling tends to deal with that particular data set, as you said, Dan, or maybe even building across several. But it's looking at your data and saying, what can I bring to this client organization, or even if you're internal, and tell them a story that they didn't know before? And maybe Mm -hmm. there'll be a little spark of something in there. And really, as I was saying in my previous examples, we're here to solve business problems, not to tell a cool story. Let Disney Mm -hmm. do that. Right, Disney. So yeah, they have the formula <laughs> down, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. And, you know, and it's a good formula and it's a proven yeah. formula. But what we need to do really is each individual case, again, what is the business problem to be solved? And often brilliant storytelling, and I've been in the room for a lot of brilliant storytelling, it illuminates something mm. in a motivating yeah. and exciting way, but it mm. doesn't necessarily connect it to the business. And I think Mm. that we really have to go back to what is the business question that we're here to solve? Do I have a retention problem? Do I have a repeat usage Mm -hmm. issue? You know, is my brand packaging failing? Whatever the question may be, but it's really, really understanding. Now, the research scope should take that on board. But what we tend to do as researchers is present, these were my objectives. This is what I found. These are my conclusions. And we can right. tell it in all kinds of fantastic ways with better and better slides, even than the Harvard graphics of yes, Mr. you are. But right. really the business, what they're, that's not just the business problem. That's also who are the decision makers. So like I talked about these times where I've been mm-hmm. in the room and they come back to me and they say, hey, Laura, what we really want to understand is this. And it's never anything that's in my deck or even contemplated in my deck. And they want mm-hmm. to have a frank mm-hmm. conversation and that mm. depends on who they are, how risk averse they are, how much money they have in their little slush fund for this quarter or for this fiscal. Right. And it right. all has to do with the yeah. business too that's trying to be solved and what other problems are. You know, if you've got a huge CapEx expenditure, really, some of these things we're presenting yeah. aren't going to change writing on the wall. Yeah. So being really cognizant, and I see us so eager to run because we're always, you know, have fewer and fewer setup days at the beginning of a project. And we just mm-hmm. run with what we're given. We might ask a couple of questions, but really probe and diagnose. What are we trying to learn here? What are the bigger issues? Where does this fit in the scope of things? And right. then your research, even if your research is already underway, understand that before you get into present. And it makes such a huge difference. You can have yeah, the exact yeah. same words, but tell it in a more compelling and convincing and persuasive way. How can researchers get better? Is it? Better understanding the business needs up front and then tailoring the research. So sort of like beginning with the end in mind, or do you think that it's just a skill that you have to acquire and kind of dig in over time or some people are better at it than others? What would you say really how can researchers kind of get better at this skill? Well, there's a bunch of things in there, Dan. I like everything you said, but what I would add to that is if you can be a researcher in the room 
when it's not just the marketing department and you're really hearing how the business is questioning and probing things, you get better at understanding what the big issues are. Don't listen for your project, listen for the business understanding. And the more you can be in the room for those other conversations, the smarter and the more sensitized you become to what people are looking for. It's also about the relationship, quite honestly, outside of the presentation day and understanding what their struggles are. And I think as a tactic, what I like to use is having researchers amongst each other sit down and really grill each other. Like get your supplier partner if you're on the client side, grill you. And why is this? And how will this make a difference? And what do you think could do here? And will any of this make a difference? And then client side question, you know, your supplier partners and say, Mm -hmm. hey, why are we doing this? How is this going to make a difference? How can we lift? Yeah. And I think it's kind of dynamics. You know, it's almost like the old fashioned in the office pilot, except what you're doing is probing people and why are we doing this? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you made a good point there. I think the onus is on not only the researcher, but also the company, you know, facilitating or needing the research to better explain what they're looking for up front rather than, you know, spending loads of money on the data and then getting it back. Like, well, this doesn't even answer the questions that we wanted. So I think having that understanding is key. So I like that you mentioned that point. Thank you. I also think that sometimes we're a little too precious about our methodologies. We are an industry that was born out of that. And a great methodology is really important. And some can make all the difference in the world. But sometimes it's just knowing what to ask and who to ask it of and how to extrapolate that and present that into your top management. Trust me, that day I had come up with that slide that was 50% blue and 50% pink. And it was a very simple pie chart. You know, mm-hmm. two big pieces of pie and everybody's like, you can't go to top management with that. And I was like, sure, you can watch me. And we had a far more engaging conversation because of it. Yeah. I'm also, I don't know if either of you or anyone listening to us has read the book Subtract, but no, I, I am a big fan Maybe of, um, there's a phrase that I hadn't heard before and they're called chart junk and it's oh. stripping down your chart to tell more instead of layering everything on that we can. I mean, data viz is great, but Mm -hmm. sometimes we add way too much for our top management. That's fine when we're talking to ourselves and getting at the nuances of our data set and what else do we need to probe. But really, when you go into top management where they're focused on the decision making, they don't want to be all stupid. I need 20 minutes to understand this chart. They want to understand it, know what to do, instinctively when they see it and they get it. And I think sometimes yeah. we're yeah. we're showing all of our degrees and our letters after our last name sometimes a little more than behooves us in the business world. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's <laughs> an interesting point because a lot of the top executives or anybody doesn't have a lot of time to like, you know, digest a bunch of content, right? So quick, easy to access graphs and analyze, I think are key. It kind of brings me back to a point that I've been wondering lately, like, you know, in college, I had to write 10, 12 page papers, but now everybody wants things on one page. So I think maybe I was getting prepared for the wrong skill there, but that's a whole separate conversation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so. but, but it's important. And I think also within company organizations, they have their standard formats at how they look at data, but that never matches up with what we're coming to show on any ad hoc or even on any continuous project. And so it's not that they can't understand it. Absolutely. They're very Mm -hmm. capable and we are of explaining it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that as soon as I look at it, I'm drawing conclusions. So let them be the powerful ones instead of the ancillary ones. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to read that book, Subtract. That sounds interesting. Yeah. It's a little academic, but the principle of it I find very empowering. Got it. No, that makes sense. Tim is baiting you a little bit here, Laura. He said, how do you feel about the NPS question type? I think this goes back into some oh. conversations that we had in the clubhouse room. So I, I couldn't. But he says, John Duff, yeah. yeah, I saw that and I couldn't pass it up. So, hi, <laughs> um, Tim. Thanks for the question. You know, this will wind me up. We should have started at the top with this because there's so much to say. I know. I know. I don't like it at all. I don't think it's helpful to business at all. Oh, what are the reasons that I could do sh- briefly? Just suffice it to say that I've never seen a case where it's been helpful and I've used it across a lot of categories. And mm-hmm. I think it's just a score because we can and not yeah. a score that helps us figure out now what do we do and is this a good thing or a bad thing? So, I mean, I've had brands growing hot with the low NPS because they didn't have enough general awareness 
They mm-hmm. were growing organically very well. And if you just looked at the NPS, it could have been a misguided signal to management to cut funding because it looked like they weren't of merit yet to have this much funding when actually, you know, their growth was really, really strong. So I think it's a messy, complicated thing. Okay, it's simple to calculate, and that's why it's caught on so much. And everybody likes to have those key numbers in their pocket. But I'm a huge disbeliever. And I'd love somebody to prove me wrong. I'm sure there are some good instances out there. Yeah. But it... You give me an idea for a future episode, Laura. <laughs> have like, you know, MPS believer and MPS, you know, non-believer and let them have it, you know. So that'd be good. Oh, I've had that round with several people on social occasions that had nothing to do with our field. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So, yeah. Perfect. I have one more question for you. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot just to get your thoughts around this. So I don't know if you've been reading any of the SMR buyer's guide and so forth that they published, but a lot of it said that organizations are bringing more research in-house and using less you know, firms to conduct the research. Not a significant amount, but enough to kind of raise some eyebrows. What are your thoughts around that, if you have any? Ooh, I've been on all sides of this. Yeah, I love it. Thanks. I think that a lot of people that are tangential to our work, think that what we are doing is running a project, running the field work, running the data collection. And that is an element. But if you are a corporate researcher, you are understanding your business and your internal users' needs and how to adequate what we're finding with what they're looking for and know when you've got something brilliant that they weren't expecting. And it's much more about understanding the business and the business users and how you deliver things to them. We're not really, I mean, I used to say to my supplier partners, I'm not just responding to partners requests all day. I'm in other meetings and I'm writing things and I'm talking to management. I'm asking questions. I'm not here just to run the field aspect. So I think when you bring in house, the weight goes to the operational portion which, mind you, is very important. and Somebody's got to run it. It does not run on its own, even online. But that is not a corporate researcher's primary focus in the day. And if we start running that inside organizations without Mm -hmm. having someone else focused on the business and the business relationships and embedded in the business unit, we won't be delivering. Mm -hmm. So I was in one of those organizations that grew as an in-house research department and then became independent and served many other clients. And it has its Mm -hmm. purpose and point in time. But I think right now it's a dangerous move as a broad strokes. I'm sure some people have strong arguments, but really you're not saving much and you're changing the focus of your smart people that are in-house and understand your business to doing something that someone else could do for them. And like you guys know, you can run several projects for multiple clients with your same skill set. You don't need mm-hmm. to know the nuance of every client's business. Right. So, yeah, no, that's interesting. I think so. you, that's a good point that you don't need to know, you know everyone's business. There's skill sets that are, I guess, you can go across many different organizations and verticals and so forth. So, no, I think that's interesting. Laura, I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up unless you have yeah. any final comments that you wanted to talk about today or anything else that you wanted to bring up. Oh, I could do this forever, Dan. I love this. So thank you. No, I mean, I just say that I've been in charge of ops and I love doing that. And I like all the people and I like the problem solving, especially because you get to solve a lot of things in one day. The client side, not so much. But it's a different thing of what you're focusing on and what a problem looks like and what a solution looks like. So again, it's not that one person can't. It's that you might be taking focus away from the business where no one else is looking at it. So right. Right. No, that's interesting. Perfect. Perfect. Well, hey, Laura, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And we'll do a round two, maybe, you know, somewhere down the line here, because I know we could talk about a lot of other topics and go down some different Love avenues. Stuff, yeah. So we'll definitely do it here soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tim, for setting up the NPS, but it's far more fun to do it with somebody who's a strong believer. <laughs> I think that's going to be the next show, do, Laura. I don't want to do a monologue, but it is one of my favorites. We're going to do the pros and cons, and you're going to be on the next show when we do that. So, Can't wait. Thank you, All guys. Right. And Thanks, Laura. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. See you soon. Wow, that is cool. awesome. Yeah, she's got such good knowledge. I really love it. Well, Mark, love let's jump into our heavily requested data points here, and we can get going, and we can wrap up the show with this. 
So Tim, he got some data points together for us from you know one of our panels here all across the US. So this first question is kind of interesting, I think. It's around, you know, Google Maps will default to the most eco-friendly route essentially when it takes about the same amount of time to help out with carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question here is at which time amount of time saved would you revert to the fastest route? So instead of taking the carbon neutral mm. route or the fastest route, mm. how much time would you give to that? I think that's very interesting. Let's see, five to 10 minutes seems to be winning. And I think I'd probably fall in the same bracket. I mean, I want to be mindful of the environment, but if I've got to get somewhere, I've got to get somewhere also. So Yeah, well, that's true. I think for me, it would be, do I have time, right, or not, right? If I'm mm. up against the wall and I need to get somewhere, I have to be there, then I probably wouldn't. But, you know, sometimes like the scenic route isn't too bad sometimes, you know? So and I think that's probably what a lot of these, you know, carbon neutral routes would be. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I like that they're thinking that way. This next one. So Uber can now track your flight. So basically a ride is ready for you when your plane lands, yeah. right? So would you be willing to book this ride up to 30 days in advance? I think this is actually cool. I would say yes to this yeah. one. It saves so much time. Absolutely. Stonewall. Yeah. yeah. Stonewall, yes. Yep, yep. Perfect. I don't know about Uber in India, but definitely here I would do it. So I would do it here for sure. I mean, it's a pain. I mean, you don't have to face that issue a lot of times when you're in India, but the next time you're here, you should try that. And you will definitely be saying a resounding yes. <laughs> I bet. I know. I know. <laughs> Although I do take Uber a lot when I'm there. So it's fun. From Pune to Mumbai, you know, I've done that Uber trip. Mm. But, uh, that's an interesting ride. If, it, no, if people haven't done that, I recommend doing that once <laughs> in your life. <laughs> All right. So this is around. So Texas or Tesla is moving their headquarters to Texas. What's interesting is in Texas, they can't legally sell Teslas directly to consumers. So they have to ship their vehicles to another state before they can deliver to their Texas customers due to some different oh. regulations and laws here. So do you think this will hurt the perception of Tesla being eco-friendly. I think, I actually don't think it will hurt that much. A lot of people said yes. I think just a lot of people don't even know mm -hmm. about these rules and regulations, right? So I think that's kind of interesting, but people say, yeah, it'll hurt. I don't know. It's just, it's one state. And I don't think a lot of people, you know, really know about it. So it's interesting though. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thinking. Okay. And then this comes next, up with a lot of these great ones. Yeah, this one, actually, I need to get this up because I need the answer key and no one else can see it here. So this is trivia that Tim did. So October is Hispanic Heritage Month in the U.S. What five countries celebrate their independence on September 15th? So I have the correct answers here because Tim was nice to give that to me. Otherwise, I would have <laughs> to give that to you. at this one. <laughs> but so the correct answers are Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. So let's see here. What did people say? So it looked like Costa Rica was right. El Salvador, Guatemala, mm -hmm. Mexico is not the right one. Mexico is September 16th, I guess. So Laura probably knows about that one. And then, you know, Chile is September 18th. So interesting, interesting there for sure. But I would say majority of people nice. got it, you know, pretty good. Some were way off, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know where Tim comes up with these trivia questions, but, you know, it keeps you on your toes for sure. <laughs> so, yeah. Tim was probably thinking about it all week. He must be like making notes. I know. He's, he's just like, yeah, looking at his shops about it too. Cool. Thanks so much for listening to the MRX Influencers Podcast. If you want more information about Question Pro, go to questionpro.com. If you want to follow me, feel free to do so on LinkedIn or Twitter. Until next time, we'll see you later. Thanks so much for listening to the MRX Influencers Podcast. If you want more information about Question Pro, go to Question Pro. Dot com. If you want to follow me, feel free to do so on LinkedIn or Twitter. Until next time, we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.